There's no doubt in my mind that James Burton is one of the great session and live guitarists in music history. He's one of those exceptional talents who could do both, who I consider one of the best at what he did with a Fender guitar and amp. On August 21st, 1939, James Burton was born in Doubly, Louisiana, a very small town about 30 miles east of Shreveport where he grew up. His parents bought him his first electric guitar from JS Music Store in Shreveport where he first saw the Fender Telecaster and knew that this was the guitar for him. This was the same guitar he would play on many recordings throughout his early career. I learned how to play on my own listening to the radio, James said. My favorite guitar players, my heroes, were Chet Atkins, Merle Travis, and Les Paul, and I wanted to play just like them, which I could. I could play a little bit like them, but I woke up one day and said, there's only one Chet, one Merle Travis, and one Les Paul, so I have to do my own thing. So that's when I started working on it, and actually when I started playing. I came up with a little style called chicken picking, which a lot of guitar players like to play like now. He had trouble using a thumb pick, so he started using the flat pick and put a finger pick on his middle finger. He liked the pop and the bright sound it gave off. He also didn't like the heavier gauge strings used back then, so he would put banjo strings on the first four strings and then substitute his last two strings, the A and E strings of the guitar set, with a D on the A and an A on the big E. If you watch James play closely, his flat pick is held loosely when he's playing with a lot of the tip exposed to the strings. With these lighter strings, he could really bend them and soon started working on getting a steel guitar sound out of it. He used to listen to KWKH in Shreveport and would hear and play along with Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, Elmore James, and Lightning Hopkins, and many more. He soon would astonish everybody with his ability to play the instrument. At only 14, James went professional, working club gigs and private parties. He would skip school just to be able to play guitar. Horace Logan was the producer of the Louisiana Hayride, and he asked if James wanted to do some shows and join the staff band. James was 14 at the time. At the Hayride, he played behind guys like George Jones, Jimmy and Johnny, Billy Walker, Johnny Horton. He remained with the Hayride for about a year. After that, a good break was to come in his career at the ripe old age of 16. James says, before I went to work with Ricky Nelson, I met him. I was working with a guy named Bob Lumen, and we were in Los Angeles doing some rehearsals on some songs to record. So we were rehearsing a song called My Gal is Red Hot, and Ricky came in one day on business while we were rehearsing, wanting to know who the band was in the next room playing. And the next day, we got a telegram from Ricky to go to the general service studios where they do the TV show Ozzy and Harriet. It was amazing. We took our instruments and we met Ozzy and Harriet, David, and all the people on the TV show. And so Ozzy said, why don't you guys do some songs for me? So we did. And Ricky got his guitar and I had my guitar, we had the bass player, and we did Mystery Train, some of the Elvis songs. Man, Ozzy said, wow, this is great. You guys want to do one on the TV show? And so that was the first introduction to doing the Ozzy and Harriet TV show. Ozzy wanted to put the song on the show. He said, this is great. But later on, we went back to Louisiana and he called me maybe two weeks later and asked me to come and join Ricky and be his lead guitar player. At my age, 16, I said, sure, I'd love to. I went out to California and joined Ricky and they invited me to come stay in their home. So I became the third son. James was to work with Ricky Nelson for almost nine years. 
and then he got a call from Johnny Cash. He wanted him to play Dobro on a TV show. This was not the Johnny Cash show. This was, as James put it, a TV show for ABC. Now, Ricky Nelson didn't want James to do this, but he talked it out with Ozzy and got it smoothed over. James went on to play it in 1964, and the show turned out to be Shindig, an American musical variety series which aired on ABC from September 1964 to January 1966. One of the producers of the show, Jack Good, knew who James was and had watched him on the Ozzy and Harriet show. He told James, I'm a big fan of yours. I want you to be on the show every week. Not sure how things were going to go after this with the Ozzy and Harriet show, James said, well, okay, what do we do? And the producer said, let's put a band together. And so the Shin Dogs were born. James on lead guitar, Delaney Bromlett on bass, Glenn D. Harden on piano, Joey Cooper on rhythm guitar, and Chuck Blackwell on drums. They would end up cutting 90% of the songs on the show. By the time Shindig ran his course, James was getting calls to do more and more studio work. He was a sought after session player, everyone from Merle Haggard to Frank Sinatra. Many of the vocalists considered him a singer's guitar player. He had helped Ricky Nelson put a band together. He was called on to help put the Shindig band together. What was next? A call from the king of rock and roll. This was in 1968, and he wanted James to play on the comeback special. But he was so busy doing session work at the time that he could not do it and had to turn Elvis down. But then Elvis called a second time and wanted him to help put a band together, not just for a TV show, but to start playing live gigs at the Las Vegas Hilton Hotel showroom. After talking with Elvis for a few hours by phone, James agreed. James was to put together the band for Elvis Presley. The new band was given suitcases full of Elvis albums and were told to familiarize themselves with all of his songs. James says, right off the bat, we probably learned 150 songs over six nights of work. They would call them down to about 30 songs to use in the show. And we must remember here, these were very well seasoned musicians and Elvis told them that he wanted them to play the songs their way so they had room to improvise. The first couple of weeks of the Las Vegas show, James played his now painted red Telecaster. I'm going to quote James here as to the story of how he came to use the Paisley Telecaster. I had a friend that was, well, he was actually the vice president of Fender. He called me. He said, I have a guitar here with your name on it. And I said, really? Well, send it to me. And he said, no, no, no. You have to come down and check it out. So I went down and had lunch with him that day. And he said, there's the guitar in the corner. So I went over and opened the case and I said, no, no, no. That's too flashy, too bright for me. But anyway, I took the guitar to Vegas with me. The first two weeks, I decided to only play my Telecaster that my mother and dad had bought me, and I played on thousands of records. And two weeks later, we had about two weeks left in Vegas. Red West came to me, the Memphis Mafia guy. He came to me and said, James, you've got to play that new guitar. So I was a little nervous about playing it. I figured, you know, it's a little too flashy, Elvis might say something on stage, and you know, might embarrass me. But anyway, I played the guitar that night. We did two shows and he never said anything. And after the second show, Elvis said, Hey James, I noticed you were playing a different guitar tonight. Man, it sounds great and it looks good. And I said, yeah. So I told him the story. I said, yeah, I was a little nervous about bringing it out on stage. I don't know what you might think about it. And he said, no, it looks great. It sounds great, so play it all you want to. So I continued playing it, 
and it was great. In 1975, Emmy Lou Harris had hired both James and Glenn Harden, who had come back into the band after the first year taking over from Larry Mahabaric for her group, The Hot Band. She would plan her tours around Elvis so she could have both men in her band as well. In 1976, Glenn D. left Elvis to play for Emmy Lou. James chose Elvis and remained with him until Elvis's death in 1977. James Burton began working with John Denver in 1977. The first album they recorded was I Want to Live. Just before Elvis died, James was called to play on a John Denver television special. During the taping, John asked if James would consider going out on a European tour. He said he was working with Elvis, but if schedule permitted, he'd be glad to go. Shortly after, Elvis Presley died. James remained a member of the band until 1994. He rejoined John in 1995 for the Wildlife Concert. In the 16 years James worked with John Denver, they recorded 12 albums and toured around the world. When John died, James was a speaker at his memorial service in Aspen, Colorado in 1997. The list of James's accomplishments could go on forever. I'll try and name a few more here. Beginning with King of America in 1986, Burton recorded and toured with Elvis Costello intermittently for about a decade. In 1988, he was a prominent part of the acclaimed Cinemax special, Roy Orbison and Friends, A Black and White Night. He is credited with being in the first music video Ricky Nelson's Traveling Man. Although he wasn't given his due, he was the creator of the music for the song Suzy Q, recorded by Dale Hawkins and later on by Creedence Clearwater Revival. In 2001, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. His induction speech was given by longtime fan Keith Richards. In 2005, he started the annual James Burton International Guitar Festival to raise money for his charitable foundation. The festival is held in the Red River District of Shreveport. On August 21, 2005, James's 66th birthday, a statue honoring him was unveiled in front of the Municipal Auditorium in Shreveport, Louisiana. Fans from all over donated money. In 2007, he was inducted into the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum in Nashville, Tennessee as a member of the L.A. session player group known as The Wrecking Crew. In 2008, James was asked by Brad Paisley to play on his upcoming album, Play the Guitar Album. Burton went along for the ride and played on an instrumental track called Cluster Pluck, as did Vince Gill, Steve Warner, Red Volkart, Albert Lee, John Jorgensen, and Brent Mason. At the 51st Grammy Awards in 2009, the song won Best Country Instrumental Performance. On August 22, 2009, on a stage at his James Burton International Guitar Festival, James Burton was inducted into the Louisiana Music Hall of Fame. In 2011, James Burton was named one of the five living legends of Shreveport, and the list goes on. James slowed down a little, but still records and makes appearances. The list of songs and bands he has recorded with is just jaw-dropping. The guy is a true legend. As I'm sure most of you know, James was diagnosed with kidney cancer the end of September and had a kidney removed October 3rd. He's back home and recovering now, but his other kidney is weak. He could really use your prayers, good thoughts, and well wishes. I'll leave a link to his website and his Facebook page in the description box under the video. Drop him a message, as I'm sure he would appreciate it. So for any of you who hasn't heard of James Burton, I hope this video gives you a little insight on him and gets your curiosity up enough to check him out further. For those of you who do know of him, I hope you enjoyed the video. I know there's still a lot left unsaid about him. 
This short video is just a chip of the iceberg on his long career. If you have any other thoughts or comments, please feel free to leave them in the comments section. Thank you all for watching. Please subscribe to the channel and don't forget to ring the notification bell. I'd appreciate it.